Um, so how many of you guys have taken the life values inventory? Can I see a show of hands? Because I know there's some of you here in the room. Perfect. Good. And how many of you um, have participated or are participating in our Becoming a More Conscious Leader program? Another show of hands. There might be some overlap there. Perfect. And how many of you have worked on your personal values with a aileron coach or a business advisor or um, anyone here, really? Another show of hands? Perfect. Well, we have a special treat for you this morning. I am overjoyed to introduce Dr. Kelly Crace who I have had the joy of knowing uh, for several years now as well. And Kelly has been instrumental in helping Aileron to understand and unpack really what, what values are, what personal values are, and why those matter, and how those help you show up to work, uh, regardless of who you are in the organization, and organizational values too. And he has really dedicated his, his life and a lot of his work to to values, to flourishing, to helping folks overcome the fear of failure. And um, it is just an absolute pleasure to introduce Kelly today. He's also the Associate Vice President of Health and Wellness at the College of William & Mary, and um, of course a licensed psychologist as well. So uh, his, his work and understanding in here, here goes deep, and he is also one of the most kind and humblest men that I have actually ever met. So it is really an honor. Welcome, Kelly. Please join me. I just absolutely love to drive from Virginia up through West Virginia and Ohio. It's one of my favorite drives, one of the most beautiful drives. Unfortunately, I was doing that around midnight in the storm last night, and so I didn't get to enjoy it, so I look forward to that view coming back. It is just really a distinct honor and privilege to be with all of you today and to learn from you uh, this morning around the issues of values and flourishing. Uh, before we get started, I, I always admire brilliance, and I always believe brilliance is, is in action is really when you can make the very complex and hard look effortless and easy. I'm looking forward to learning your brilliance today, but I wanted to acknowledge first the brilliance of our wonderful professional colleagues in Andy and Jay and the AV and IT setup that they do. They're just, in what they do in working with me, they are absolutely brilliant. So if we could give Jay and Andy a hand in there. Thank you. Also, please know there's plenty of seats here. If you want to make your way and find a seat, you're, you're welcome to. You go on your comfort level. I'm here today to kind of share with you some things that we've learned over the past 30 years around research, around what really predicts flourishing. Um, the interest in that came from me in two professional lines. One, I come from a, a, um, a multi-generational family business. I represented the fourth generation of a family business and was always fascinated by the process of how we could on one day just be functioning on all cylinders and the next day with no loss of talent, no loss of intelligence, we were sputtering. And I was always fascinated by that. And then I also moved into the field of psychology and really wanted to work with life transitions, and important life transitions. That started 30 years ago in working with elite athletes and performing artists that had undergone career-ending injuries. So at a time of profound lostness for them by working their entire life for one single thing and it being taken away in an instant, what resulted in recovery? And we found that our typical kind of counseling recovery techniques for loss and recovery were not working. They were actually getting worse. We found a portal of recovery through values work. But we also stumbled across something that we didn't expect because we always learned and we always had heard that values were an incredibly central, important piece of flourishing, of us being at our best. What we didn't know is that it also leads to a particular vulnerability, and a vulnerability that we as human beings don't manage so well. So we became fascinated by that and really wanted to understand what truly predicts flourishing. Now, flourishing is a term you hear all the time now. 30 years ago, and, and in our research, we defined flourishing by these three things, a consistent level of productivity, fulfillment, and resilience. So in essence, we were really looking at effectiveness. 
We weren't looking at values and ethics, values and morality. We were looking about the relationship between values and effectiveness. So when you're flourishing, you feel like, I'm doing good work. You're being productive. I'm doing good work. I find meaning in that work. And I find myself to be resilient through the harshness and hardness and sometimes unfairness of the world around that work. That's when we're flourishing. The interesting thing we found is there are no natural born flourishers. And there's no little special island of a flourishing species of super flourishers out there. We, we find that people that deeply flourish work at it. They work at it. They're very intentional about it. And they work at it every day, not because of a deficit that they have in terms of, I just can't learn this stuff. It's because the world doesn't foster for flourishing. The world drifts us from flourishing. We are now in a world of relentless uncertainty, relentless change, and relentless pace. It used to be, many years ago, it used to be you could gear up for major life transitions but also experience a period of rhythm afterwards until the next one. That no longer exists. Every single year, you are managing some kind of important change or those around you, significant others are managing an important change that are affecting you. Your system and brain processes that as stress. Because all change, even the most positive change, involves some loss and some uncertainty. Because you're leaving something and what you're heading to is uncertain. Your brain processes that as loss and fear. How do you manage that? So what we became very interested in is what truly predicts flourishing and can you train it? Can you train that with ourselves in, our, in terms of our own sense of self-leadership and in leading others? That's what I want to share with you a few brief minutes. I'm going to bore you with about 15 minutes of helping you understand the concepts of what we learned in our research. And this is not me requesting or suggesting or preaching that this is right and true. This is only just, here's what we've learned so far. I want you to trust your wisdom. And so here's a request that I have for you today. I don't want you to take any notes because I'll show you uh, an open educational resource that's free and available to everyone that has all this information available that's on our research and also the training process. What I ask for you to do is to just be actively curious. Not just be actively curious, because that's hard. Active curiosity takes energy. But I want you to be actively curious today and listen for two things. One thing of relevance for you in your optimal development, your optimal wellness, your sense of flourishing. And one thing in terms that might be relevant for someone in your life that looks to you as a mentor. Someone that in your relationship with them, you know they look to you. You know you influence them. Think of that person today and think of one thing that we talk about. I'm going to talk about several strategies for flourishing. Pick one that resonates for you, one that resonates for the person that you influence. And that's it. And that's enough. Because in all the information you've learned over the past two days, I just want you to have one takeaway. If you, if you can't get those two takeaways from today, that's my failure. That's not yours. And I want you to trust your wisdom. Because at some level, if it doesn't feel relevant for you, there's a reason for that. And trust that and look for something else the rest of the day. Why do we as human beings have this natural vulnerability to stay stuck at good? As we were looking at flourishing, we found that there's this plateau effect that occurs that the more we focus on our values, actually the more vulnerable we have of reaching a plateau. Now, you're lucky. You're good is comparatively great. But even when we have great talent, we know and suffer at some level when we're stuck at good. Why does that occur? I want you to kind of look at a couple of graphs that we did from our research. And I just want you to think about them in terms of what you've heard. Here's one of the things that's so important today. It's about paradigm shifting. Some of the, one of the reasons we stay stuck at good is because the things that we're taught, some of the things that we're taught that lead to flourishing don't. They actually get in your way. I'll give you an example. If you're willing and able, everyone stand up and give yourself a little bit of room. So turn sideways to give yourself a little bit of leg room. See, you were the wise ones on the sides because you already knew. You were already standing. You, you had this premonition already. I want everyone to raise your dominant hand really high. If you're ambidextrous, just pick one. Then raise the opposite leg to where your knee is hip high. And close your eyes. OK, have a seat. Where did your, where did your attention go when I told you to close your eyes? 
Balance. Everybody's attention went to balance. How many of you, when you tried to be more balanced, found yourself less balanced? I cheated. My eyes were open. I saw you weaving. One of the biggest predictors of languishing, not flourishing, is striving for work-life balance. How many of you have heard the importance of work-life balance and the importance of trying to be more balanced in our life with work-life? Doesn't work. Actually has the opposite effect. The more you strive for work-life balance, the more you become very aware of, one, how impossible it is to do it, how the world doesn't allow for it, and then you end up punctuating that, that intention with either guilt because of my failure to be able to be balanced or being mad and resentful of the world for not allowing us to balance. There's also this real unintended message in there that I don't think is intended, but it still works against us. Work-life balance implies at some level that your work is not an important part of your life. How many of you are training for a life, a work, a work role, to where you can just clock in and clock out and then your life starts at 5 o'clock? All of you are here because work is an important part of your meaning, an important part of your purpose. People that flourish, they don't strive for work-life balance. Instead, they strive for work-life harmony. They strive for harmony instead of balance. What does that mean? Very simply this. They start every morning and they ask themselves, What's the right devotion of my time and energy to the things that matter most to me? So let's say, for example, work, relationships, and leisure are three roles that are important to you right now. To be balanced, that needs to look like 33, 33, 33 every day. Instead, people that flourish go and say, what's the most right devotion of that time and energy today? One day it might be 90% this, 5% that, 5% that. But then they wipe the slate clean every day and ask the same question as if they'd never asked it before. What that results in is it results in more balance. So what we found is the more you strive for balance, the less you achieve it. The more you strive for harmony, the more centered and balanced you feel. Imagine an orchestra playing in a balanced way and how awful that would sound versus an orchestra playing in a harmonic way. So these are things that we started to learn about our brain. How does our brain react to some of the messages that we're taught? Well, one of those messages is being able to look at how centrally important values are to effectiveness. And in the past, we always assumed, and research was suggesting, that the relationship looked like this. A linear relationship that the more you pay attention to your values, the more value-centered you are, the more effective you become. And it makes so much sense because we, we figured if you focus on what's important, then by focusing on what's important, I'll be motivated. And I'll be motivated toward that, and from that, I'll act. A clear, distinct, linear relationship. This is where the notion of willpower came in. Did you know the strategy of willpower fails you over 82% of the time? It's one of the least effective strategies for effective behavior. Why? Because this is really what we found happens. The relationship looks like this. Because what we found is the more you focus on what's important to you, the more you'll realize that you'll find conflicting motivations. And with those conflicting motivations, there's conflicting actions. And we don't tend to manage that really well. So as we started looking at this, we started wondering, why does this occur? Why is this curvilinear, curvilinear relationship here? Why does it exist? And what do we do about it? So I need a volunteer to help me demonstrate the plateau effect of why do we as human beings have this natural vulnerability to stay stuck at good. Can I get a volunteer? First hand. First hand I saw. Do you mind coming up? Hi, come on around here. I'm Kelly. I'm Michelle. Michelle, nice to meet you. Give Michelle a big hand, please. Okay, Michelle. So... We've got, I'm going to give you two choices. I'm going to have you demonstrate a couple of things, and you've got your choice. You can do the exercise that I do with college students, which is a little less dignified, or you can do the more dignified way. What are you up for? Dignified. Okay, so you're okay with the less dignified? Uh, less All dignified, right, great. Yeah. So stay up there. I'll be right with you. Okay. Now, first, are you, are you allergic to sunflower seeds? I'm not. Okay. All right. Do you have anything in your mouth? Do you have any gum? I do. No, we'll go ahead and spit it out. Yeah. And you're not like a professional seed spitter that you get money for this kind of stuff, do you? No. Oh, okay. All right. So here, take a couple of these in your hands. Okay. All right. So here's the deal. 
Since you volunteered, you got to be all in, okay? All right, so here's what I want you to do. First, I want you to put one in your mouth. You don't need to crack it up or anything. Put your head directly over the trash can and try to spit it in. If you make it, I'll give you $5. And if you, wait, 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 wait. And if you miss it, you don't owe me anything. Does that sound fair? Yeah. Okay, anytime you're ready. Oh, give Michelle a big hand. <laughs> Got to take it. Got to okay. take it. Okay, so back up a little bit. A little bit, all the way to where the speakers are there. Right? There. Right. Perfect. Don't step back off the steps. Put it right here. That would be good right here. <laughs> I, I wouldn't do that to you. I wouldn't do that to you. Okay, so here's what I want you to do. If you make it from there, I'll give you $40. And if you miss it, you don't owe me anything. Sound okay? Still got to spit it. Still got to spit it from there. That was scarily close. That actually was closer, <laughs> much closer than I, yeah, exactly. So what distance do you think, after watching Michelle's performance today, what distance do you think she has about a 50-50 chance of making it or missing it? About right here? OK. So here's the offer now. If you make it from there, I'll give you $20. But if you miss it, you owe me 20 $20. Now, wait a second. <laughs> I, lo I love your spirit in this. <laughs> you went to the summit yesterday, didn't you? See, look, look at flourishing in action here. So here's the deal. Even though you're volunteering and you're all in, you always have the agency to barter with me. You can always negotiate with me. So first, 20 for 20, is that acceptable to you or do you want to negotiate? Do you have 20 on you? Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So, so 40, 40 for um, 18? Oh, 40 for 23. 18. 18. Okay. All right. Does that sound completely fair to you? Yes. Okay. Take a big step forward then. All right. Anytime you're ready. Wait a second. Freeze. Your name, sir? Keith. Keith. Now, I know you don't know, but what do you think Keith's thinking about you right now? Okay, all right. Your name, ma'am? Tara, what do you think Tara's thinking about you right now? She's supporting me as well. I, I, I am. Now, I don't know if either one of them have any help for me, but they, they want me to do this. Okay, great. Keith, was that exactly what you were thinking in the moment? Tara, was that exactly what you were thinking in the moment? Okay, anytime you're ready. Go. Okay. <laughs> oh, good try. <laughs> You keep the $5, you earned it, okay? Thanks, Michelle, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank Take care. Give Michelle a big hand. So let's take the same three situations, the same exact conditions, but let's add three zeros to each situation. $5,000, $40,000, $20,000. Do you think most people in the first situation feel stress? The $5,000? No, they don't. Why not? No risk, no risk, and what else? High probability of success, exactly. No risk, high probability of success, no stress. What about in the $40,000 situation? Do you think most people feel stress? Intuitively, you think they do, and they don't. Why possibly not? There was no risk. What else? There was no expectation to succeed. Exactly. No offense to Michelle, but we didn't expect her to make that. And she scarily came very close to making that. <laughs> but no expectation to succeed, no risk, no stress. What about the third situation? Is there stress there? Absolutely. Because what Michelle demonstrated is what happens in your brain, what occurs in your brain once something becomes important to you. Once something matters, something or someone matters, there are three unavoidable truths that you can't escape. The first is uncertainty. Truth is you never completely control everything that goes into something that matters to you. There's always a chance you could fail or lose that thing or person of importance. And if you did, there would be a cost. You would pay some kind of cost. We also know that in today's time, anytime you're engaged in something that matters to you, we are aware that people are forming opinions about it. 
people who are watching us. And our perception of what they may be thinking may be accurate and it may be inaccurate. But if you dare to care, you can't avoid these three things. And when these three things get activated in your brain, this is the result. This is what you experience. This is not danger fear. It's the part of your brain that gets activated when you're aware of two concurrent things. I care and uncertainty about what I care about. We experience it as pressure. That's how you feel it. You feel it as psychological and emotional pressure, which is a good thing. It's not a bad thing at all. But if you were to naturally respond to this in the way that your brain naturally wants to, you'll go in one of two directions. You'll either over control and master or you'll avoid and escape until it has to be done. Perfectionism and procrastination are the neurologically natural ways we cope with values-based fear. Fully human, it's what we're wired for. And we attain excellence with it because this is the fear-based model of excellence because you actually attain excellence. What you're doing is you're kicking your sympathetic and you're using your sympathetic nervous system as a way to kick into a different gear. Make sense? Feel relevant? I mean, have we all seen this? Here's an interesting thing. As you are working with people that you're leading and thinking about and building teams, young adults of today between the ages of 17 and 30 have the highest incidence of fear of failure than any other previous generation because of something wonderful and wise about them. This generation no longer wants to succeed. They want to succeed in something meaningful. But the competition for those meaningful opportunities has never been more fierce. So when they look at that, Importance is higher, uncertainty is higher, and fear is higher. And what that results in is by the time they reach our doorsteps at a university, they have become specialists and experts at controlling and avoiding their way to excellence. And they come into your workforce with that same, same kind of drive and same kind of mentality. Calls. They're just that talented and intelligent to pull it off when it has to, or they've been able to control everything, most everything in their life. So they have this belief that I can do it perfectly. The reason why we do this is because if I do it perfectly, I don't have to worry about failing. Or if I can sidestep this pressure and step in when it has to be done, it doesn't matter if you're afraid once it has to be done. That's why it works for us. This is also why we stay stuck at good. This is the reason for the plateau effect. Because what we found is the fear-based model of excellence eventually hits a ceiling effect and an increase in cost. You will start to experience an increase in cost of this kind of model. And you'll start to see that it gets in your way. You're just not performing. You're just not as effective as you could be. Think about it in terms of intensity and relief. This is characterized by perfectionism is characterized by long periods of intensity and short periods of relief, and the emotional residue is chronic worry because you've got to constantly worry about everything you've got to control. Over here, this is characterized by long periods of relief and short periods of intensity, and the emotional residue is chronic guilt because you feel guilty about waiting until the last minute. So you just go back and forth between worry and guilt, worry and guilt. How many of you have found yourself in this last minute project telling yourself, I am never going to put myself through this again. I am not doing this again. And then three weeks later saying, I am not going to put myself through this again. It's what we're wired for. It's what we naturally do. Why? So that started, help. first of all, does that make sense? This is what helped us understand this. Because what we learned is that when we, the only chance we have of flourishing is to devote some attention to our values. But there's this point of diminishing return where a value starts to shift into a need state. And when a value shifts into a need state, you put yourself in a psychological place of press. You're pressing too hard. And passion turns into intensity. And in that intensity, you just get in your way. Remember, nothing bad's happening here. We're not talking about the difference between flourishing and languishing. Because when you get to languishing, your, your brain already sounds off the alarms of, I've, I've got to do something here. I'm talking about hovering at good. And this press, all of you know enough about performance psychology to know when we're in a place of press, it gets in our way. Over here, you're staying in a place of hope. Now, hope is a wonderful thing, but not as a motivational strategy. I didn't study for this test. I hope it's easy. I didn't prepare for this presentation. I hope everybody likes me anyway. So what happens is over here, you're calling a value a value, but you're really, it's a want. 
It's a preference. And we will not be fully committed. Preferences are not enough to form a motivational drive consistently. I can prefer to be at a certain level of skill or a certain level of fitness. As long as it's a preference, I won't get there. But over here, if it moves toward a need, it also gets in my way. There's a difference between valuing achievement and needing to achieve, and valuing to belong and needing to belong. Because if I need, if I need to belong to Keith, the first thing Keith's going to do is back up from my intensity. It's the biggest human repellent is need. But if I value Keith, that's more attractive. How do we move toward this? So why do we stay stuck at good? What causes this to happen? And it's essentially what happened is what started with the why, meaning, importance, became eclipsed by the what if. What if I fail? What if I lose this thing of importance? Whenever you lead with fear, you move into a need state. And what you're needing is reassurance that everything's going to be okay, which is particularly vulnerable during transition times. You will look for that reassurance by becoming very dependent on outcomes. Very dependent on outcomes. And then your brain starts keeping score. And what happens is you develop this chronically evaluative mindset, this chronically evaluative mindset to where you're constantly judging. How did it go now? How did it go today? How did it go compared to yesterday? How did it go compared to Michelle? We're always judging. And what happens is it gets in the way. It gets in the way of our effectiveness. Do you know a chronically evaluated mindset is the number one cause of insomnia today? Quieting the body, mind turns on, starts playing back the day. The point is you never punctuate that playback neutrally. You'll always end that playback with some kind of judgment about yourself and some kind of implication of what that means for the future. And that's what gets in the way. So this is why we experience the plateau effect. Now we're going to move into what do you do about it? And this is where I'm going to turn you loose. We're going to go through some exercise. I'm going to share with you a few strategies for you to think about of what we've learned that people that deeply flourish, what they do, and what they do is they go through several paradigm shifts. They think differently. They train their mind to think differently so that it moves into this place of being able to put values and fear in the right place. So essentially what happens is the more value-centered you are, the more you also open the portal to other experiences that we as human beings don't manage very well. And one of them is fear. We realize there's this dynamic relationship between values and fear. You cannot have one without the other. You cannot care about anything without uncertainty being a part of it. So therefore, your brain processes that as fear. What we find is as long as values lead and fear is in its sweet spot, you flourish. When fear brings to the foreground, you plateau. The noise and relentless nature of our world pulls fear to the foreground every single day. So you must mentally do something intentionally to move values back to the foreground. I'm going to share with you some strategies for the rest of the day for you to think about. And what I want you to do is pick one. Pick one that speaks to you. And I'm going to ask for something that I haven't earned. I'm going to ask for your trust when I haven't earned it yet. I'm going to actually take you through a few exercises without telling you why. So I'm going to ask for your open-mindedness and open-heartedness. Just be actively curious. And then I'll share with you, I promise I won't leave you hanging. I'll share with you why and what it means as to what this is about. And again, this is not about happiness. This is not about feeling good. This is about effectiveness. What we've learned leads to effectiveness. Questions about this so far before we turn you loose? Make sense? Okay. So I'm going to hand out, if I can get some assistance, we're going to hand out a, a, a one-page handout that's going to start the beginning of a first exercise. And then if, if I can get some help with that, that would be wonderful. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. There you go. I'll start in the back and come forward. Ah! Hey, oh. Thanks, Jeremy. Appreciate it. How you doing? 
Thanks, sir. Thank you. Thanks, sir. That piece. Thanks. There you go. Do y'all have y'all have some standing up? Okay. Thank you. Need more? Thanks, sir. Andy, we doing we doing okay? Everything right? Okay. Excuse me, Jen. Any more? Got him? Okay. Thank I'm going to hand these to you in the cake. Excuse me, sir. Sorry. Sorry to walk over you. Excuse me. Sorry. Excuse me, sir. Thank you. Excuse me. Sorry. Okay, so... Jay, I told, did exactly what you told me not to do, so I apologize for that, speaking into the speaker. This is a brief exercise. This comes from the Life Values Inventory. As we started realizing the importance of values, what we did is we, we started using certain assessment strategies, and we found that there was some problem in some of the typical values assessments. They weren't very culturally sensitive. They were highly gendered in their language. It was a lot often about values infusion instead of values clarification, what you should value instead of what do you value. And they were also very mood dependent. A lot of them were very open-ended questions, various things like that. And we found you could answer those questions and come back a week later and be in a different mood and answer the questions completely differently. So we wanted to find something more consistent. We spent over 10 years fully empirically from a completely empirical standpoint of starting with over 200 values and really looking at what was empirically most stable across generations and across cultures. These 14 values that you came up with were the, that, that are in front of you were the most stable values across generations and across cultures. Are these only values that exist? No. It's just a good start. Also, this is not the tool. It's a tool. And so if it resonates with you, fine. If it doesn't, that's okay too. Also, the definitions are empirically derived. So when you read these values, if that doesn't fit for you, trust your lens. Trust your personal lens of how you define these values. But I want you to read through them. And first what I'd like for you to do is I'd like for you to circle or identify three to five values right now that are high priority values in your life. By high priority, you define that in two ways. One, these are important to me right now. And two, I frequently act on them. These are important to me and I frequently act on them. Not quality, not perfectly, but I f frequency of action. So I ought to be able to follow you around for a month and come up with the same answer because I see it in your behavior. High priority values as defined by important to me right now, frequently acting on them. Circle three to five. What we're going to go through is a process that's related to what we call the Authentic Excellence Initiative. This is the result of the training program that we developed that once we identified what predicts flourishing, can you train it? And this is a program that we offer organizations and offer at the university level. It's at William & Mary. We have over 2,000 students each year voluntarily go through the program to offer a sense of greater resilience and flourishing. We're going to go through a couple of strategies, pick some that may be relevant for today. The first one is fundamental. It's a different way of thinking about a particular topic. I'm going to ask you a few questions. I want you to think about the answer, and then I'm going to ask you to share your answer with the partner next to you. I'd like for it to stay in pairs if we could so we have time, so we can have time to share, but we can quickly move through it. If it turns out to be threes, that's okay, but no more than three. Also, we're going to move around a little bit. So you're not going to stay with the same partner the whole time. So this is going to be chaotic. So I, I know of no better group than here that knows the ability to embrace chaos because I know what your background is. So we're just embrace the chaos today, and we're going to move around, but there's a point to it. 
First question. I want you to look at the all 14 values, not just your high priority values. I want you to look at your all 14 values. And I want you to share with your partner, rewinding this past 12 months, thinking of the past 12 months from August to past August. Just rewind what you experienced 12, over the past 12 months. Quickly rewind. What did you experience near the end of last year and in the beginning of this year and as you moved into the middle and third quarter as we move into that? And I want you to share with your partner a value that has changed the most for you over the past 12 months. A value that has changed the most for you over the past 12 months. It may have changed in importance. It may have been the, it's the same level of importance, but I'm acting on it differently. It looks different now. Share with your partner a value that has changed the most for you over the past 12 months and why. Why did that change occur? Now, what I'm going to ask you to do is to share and then hear from your partner. Just go back and forth. A very important part of flourishing. There's as much, and I'll explain why in a little while. There's as much value in what you hear as what you share. So be actively curious. Also, because of our limited time, we're going to have to move through this quickly because some of these questions you could spend all day on, which I'm fine with doing that. We can stay till midnight if we want to on this, but I don't think you would want to. So did, am I dating myself? Did anybody use, ever use play red light, green light growing up? Ever play red light, green light? Okay, so we're going to do the same thing with processing. When I say green light, I want you to share with each other. Just go back and forth and share. When I say yellow light, I want you to draw the conversation to a close. And when I say red light, we're going to stop and move to the next question. Sound fair? Find your partner, share what value has changed the most for you the past 12 months and why. And red light. So, if I cut you off at red light, if you didn't have a chance to fully share, make sure you share first next time so there's a nice balance of sharing. But we're going to kind of hit and move. Stay with your same partner. And share with your partner, now what I want you to do is think 12 months in advance. Go 12 months ahead. Over this next year, starting August of this year to next August, share with your partner a value you most hope to affect over the next 12 months. Share with your partner a value you most hope to affect. Why that one? Why now? And what do you want that effect to be? I use the word effect intentionally because you may actually want to decrease acting on this. I may actually want to decrease the importance of this in my life. Whatever it is, what value do you hope to most affect over the next 12 months? Why that one? Why now? And what do you want that effect to be? Ready? Green light. Same partner. <laughs> Along the way, <clears throat> if you don't mind, I'm going to share a few little tips of some sub-strategies we found along the way in our research. One of them is related to the issue of values and stress in our people of emotional intimacy, our significant others, people that are in our life that we're emotionally close to. We have this natural vulnerability. And let me stop there, too. We, flourishing and vulnerability are two really used terms nowadays. Vulnerability has two levels. There's two, one, one part definition of vulnerability is a challenge. The other is a strength. The vulnerability of, that's a challenge is when we say vulnerability, what we're talking about is times when we naturally respond to things and it results in getting in the way. So that, that vulnerability is a type of challenge. It's just the natural way we respond, does it help or does it cause us to be stuck? Some of the vulnerabilities we're going to talk about today are that kind of challenge. The other vulnerability is the vulnerability that's associated with wholeheartedness open-mindedness, open-heartedness, being in this place of active curiosity. That's vulnerability as a strength. So I want to make sure we understand the distinction between those two. We as human beings have this natural vulnerability, a natural challenge, to share more the stress of our values than the joy of them with our emotionally intimate partners. Now, part of that is the contract of emotional intimacy. That's what we sign up for when we decide to be close with each other. We're there for each other. We sign up for supporting each other. So that's part of it. But we have this natural vulnerability of overshooting that and sharing more the stress of our values than the joy of them. You're just stressing me out with your sense of responsibility. Your responsibility drives me crazy. As soon as you walk in, I'm like, ah. Oh. So 
being able to understand how that works, what we find is people that flourish are just very intentional of being very intentional about an equilibrium, of making sure with their emotional partners that they share the joy of what matters to them as well as the stress. One of the best examples I ever experienced is we had this, we had this graduate student, this uh, social worker, and she was sharing her most important values, and we asked her what was one of her most important values, and it was concern for others. And when we asked how did it get there, she said, well, my mom was a social worker, and she was a single parent. And every day she came home absolutely exhausted. But we sat at dinner every night, and every night what she always talked about was the honor that she felt that people would open themselves up and share their suffering with her. And she talked about it in this joyful way while exhausted. And this little girl sitting at the table said, I want some of that. Whereas often it's just the opposite in the mental health field. Clinicians come home exhausted, depressed after what they've heard all day, and the children see that, and they see this huge cost of concern for others, and they run the other way. So it's important to share the joy as much as the stress of your important values. That's why you need to understand that double-edged sword of what the stress looks like for you, so you can understand that. Next question, find quickly find another partner. Quickly find another partner for the next question. Next question. Share with your partner, pick another value, any one of the three to five. It can be one you've shared before or a different one. But pick a value in your high priority values, one of those three to five, and share with your partner what fear is attached to this value for you. Remember, you cannot care about anything without fear being right there. So fear will be a part of anything that's important to you. So for example, people with responsibility. The fear can often be the fear of disappointing others. People with responsibility would rather you be mad at them than be disappointed in them. Nothing is worse than having them look at you in the eye and with disappointment saying, you let me down. So that's a fear. Concern for others, the fear of losing sensitivity or the fear of not helping. A young man the other day, his, his value was achievement and his fear was the fear of regret. I said, so what do you do with that? He said, I just, I go full bore into everything and then crash and then go and then crash. But what, helped, what, he, what he understood for the first time is he always nobilized that and thought, that's because of achievement. That's what I do. This is what it looks like if you, if you value achievement. What he started to see is, no, that's your fear. That's how you're managing fear with achievement, is pouring yourself full bore and then crashing and recovering, which helped him understand, I don't have to do it this way. I can more optimally express this value of achievement. So pick a value, a high priority value, and share with your partner what fear is attached to this value. And how do you manage that fear? Whether it's healthy or unhealthy, it doesn't matter. We're all human. How do you manage that fear? Ready? Green light. Stay with your same partner. Looking at all 14 values, doesn't matter if it's high priority or not. Looking at all 14 values, share with your partner a value that you use as an anchor to get you through difficult times, times of distress, times of heartbreak, just times where there's this chronic too muchness. Is there a time, is there a value that you will hold on to to get you through that difficult time? You may have more than one. Just share one. Share how it works for you. Why do you turn to that value? What does it do for you? And what do you have to be careful of? So a student the other day shared that privacy was her anchor value, the getting through difficult times. And she said, when I'm upset, if I can get away by myself, I can think deeply, I can feel deeply, I can get perspective. And when I said, what do you have to be careful of? She said, I stay too long. I over-isolate. So then I start to feel the stress of disconnection with others. So share a value that is an anchor for you, why it works, how it works well for you, and what do you have to be careful of? Ready? Green light. Same partner. Green light. <laughs> Next question. Only 43 more questions and we're getting there. We're going, we're going to be out of here by five, I promise. 
Two more questions. Last two questions. It's a part A and part B. I'm going to ask a very unfair question, but hang with me. If you could only be remembered for one thing, if you could only be remembered for one thing, what would you want that to be? That's very unfair. People of your talent and wisdom, you'll be remembered for a lot of things. But if no one could remember anything but one thing, what would you want that to be? When I remember Krista, the only thing I remember about her is this. What would she hope I would say? This is not a tombstone question. This can be something that is relative to someone that sees you for a week. Someone sees you for a week. What do you hope? Two-day summit. What do you hope they remember about you? And does it map to any one of these 14 values? So if you could only be remembered for one thing, what would it be? And does it map to one of these 14 values? Doesn't have to. If it doesn't, that means we missed something. And come up with your own label. Share with your partner, if you could only be remembered for one thing, what would you hope that it would be? What would it be? Ready? Green light. <laughs> Last question. Last question. If you could actually be remembered for two things, what would be the second thing that you would add to the first, and does it map to one of the 14 values? So if you could add a second thing, what would be the second thing you would add to be that you wanted to be remembered for and doesn't map to one of those 14 values? Ready, green light. Okay. Don't look at them yet while I explain why do we go through that exercise. First of all, thank you for being so open-minded and curious and being able to share this, share your responses with each other. Why do we do that? Here's one of the things that we found. What we're trying to do is essentially, in the Life Values Inventory, which that, that, this is the online program you can go on, it's essentially designed to not just assess your values. It's designed to do something else. All of the paradigm shifts that we talk about today are all about moving you beyond your neurology. Our world fosters us to stay at our neurology. What I mean by that is we're wired for crisis and regulation. That's what we're wired for. Step into the urgency of the day and then seek comfort after that. To where every day starts to become about have-tos and comfort. Take care of all your have-tos and then seek comfort. That's what the world fosters us to do is to stay at our neurology. However, it's actually not what our species is intended to. When we are at our most effective, we are a purposeful relational species. The only chance you have of flourishing is to live with a sense of purpose but also have enough sensitivity around you to know how does my sense of purpose in living that impact you? And how does your sense of purpose impact me? And understand, that's when we flourish. So what we learned is that people that flourish don't rely on values clarification because we found that values clarification does absolutely nothing for you. Well, they move instead from values clarification to values relationship. What does that mean? It means one to two times a year, people that deeply flourish get away by themselves and they reflect on the questions that I asked you. How are my values alive in my life? Aspirational values do nothing for you. My badge, here are my top five values. I've got my badge, here are my values. Do absolutely nothing for you. You'll stay at your most natural level of motivation. Human beings are most naturally motivated by fear and comfort. That's what we're most naturally motivated by. But the purest, deepest form of human motivation that supersedes willpower, fear, and fatigue are your values, but only if you have a relationship with them. Only if you know exactly how they are alive in my life, how they bring joy, how they bring stress, the interaction of them, what fears are attached to them, what do they look like healthy, what do they look like unhealthy. The same thing that you ask of your healthiest relationships, which hopefully one to two times a year you're checking in saying, how are we doing? You don't do that every day, but you need to do that in order to go to a deeper level of relating. Same thing with your values. Why? Very simply, it moves you beyond your neurology to a deeper level of motivation that overrides fear, fatigue, and willpower. You just did that. And in fact, 
I'm happy, I've got a handout that has a whole list of questions that are good questions to reflect on and ask of others. I'm happy to share that with Nicole and she can share that with all of you. But they don't stop there. They don't do that reflection. They then take that reflection, share it with someone else and ask the same of them. Because in hearing about your values relationship, it deepens and internalizes my sense of relationship with my values even better. So the life values inventory is not a values clarification exercise. It's an empirically derived snapshot of your current relationship with your values. That's the whole point of it. Why? To go to a deeper level of motivation. But then they don't stop there. They also recognize that the most important predictor of relational flourishing as you all know, is healthy boundaries, boundary setting. So what they do is they then go through this exercise that you've got in front of you. And what I want you to do is I want you to practice. I want you to pick one of your top three to five values and high priority values that you circled from that list. I want you to pick one, and I want you to put it on that handout and practice this for just a minute. I want you to put that value down, write that value down on the left-hand side, and then I want you to think about what does this value look like in action? Not, not what do I want it to be, what's ideal. What does this value look like in my behavior when it's healthy and when it's unhealthy? What does this value look like healthy in action and what does it look like unhealthy? And remember, it's your behavior. It's not the outcome of your values. It's the expression of that value, the action on that value. So with belonging, you wouldn't say, well, it's healthiest when I feel really close to everybody. No, that's an outcome that you don't completely control. What are you doing to get close to people? What are you doing with that value that allows you to get close to people? So it's got to be your action, your behavior. And then what does that look like healthy, and what does that look like when it crosses into unhealthy? Take a moment and just play with that. Just think about that. You can write it down, or you can just reflect on it for a minute. You can either go in the LVI and take the values inventory of itself and then go through this exercise, or you can just use the handout. But I want you to take those three to five values, and I want you to map those. I want you to blueprint those on that worksheet of looking what it looks like, healthy and unhealthy. Because here's what we learned about people that flourish. They can tell you boom, 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 exactly what their values look like in action and when it crosses over to being unhealthy. Why is that so important? The world drifts us and pulls us into an unhealthy expression of our values. If I know exactly what I, that looks like, I catch it sooner. And when I'm over there, if I know what it looks like healthy, I can get back to that sooner. In a second, I can choose what healthy looks like. If I don't know that, you find yourself drifting until you're way, way over here, and what you're feeling is intensity. You're going to feel that in an extreme way. And if in that moment, all you're going to be thinking about is soothing. There's a difference between soothing and self-care. Soothing, all you're intending in that moment is to feel better, is to change how you feel. That doesn't necessarily mean healthy self-care. Because the only thing you're thinking about with soothing is to change brain chemistry. And the only four things that, that change brain, brain chemistry in an instant is food, drugs, sex, and pain. That's the only thing that changed brain chemistry in a minute. The problem is, when we're soothing, we don't moderate that well. We don't moderate that well. When we move over into this unhealthy place, if I don't know what that looks like, we drift further and further, and we lose our ability to find what healthy looks like. Because all you're thinking about is feeling better in that moment. Self-care is no crystallized what healthy and unhealthy looks like, so you catch and recover quicker and you move into healthy self-care. Why is that so important? Here's what you'll notice. So, one, they change how they think about values. Instead of thinking about values clarification, they change into thinking in a relational way with their values. Secondly, they change how they define their worth. They move from changing about defining their worth by equity and moving it toward integrity personal integrity. Your vulnerability with your high priority values are that you will seek equity. I'm doing my part. I'm working on these values. I want a return on that. That's human nature, and that's absolutely fine. But when I need equity, it gets in the way. 
Instead, the, the cornerstone of adult self-esteem is predicated on personal integrity, which is my behavior lining up with what I say matters to me. That's integrity. Never perfectly aligns. But when they're closely aligned, we flourish. When those separate, we suffer. So they start to define their worth by the expression of their values, by their values in action. That's what success is for them. And when they get equity and get fairness, that's just icing on the cake. That's just a great day. But success is defined by the expression of my values. And you do better. You actually perform better. What you'll notice when you go through this exercise, here's what you'll start to notice, healthy versus unhealthy. This is what healthy and unhealthy will look like. As you map that out, you'll notice in healthy expression, it's very purpose-driven, very process-oriented, and it has a realistic expectation of time and energy. Over here is when you're starting to move into a need state. Habits, tendencies, looking for comfort. It's very outcome-oriented. This is equity and need-driven. This is courage-driven because this is hard. <laughs> it's hard. It takes courage. And so you should honor the courage of trying to live with integrity because it's just that hard. Dr. King said heroism is the courage to live every day by your values. That's heroic. And that's because our world doesn't foster it. But there's one more way that we move into this expressive mindset, that we move to being kind of, instead of equity-driven, integrity-driven. I'm going to give you a loving challenge. I would like for you to try something for eight weeks, every day. It takes less than five minutes. But I want you to try this for eight, bless you, try this for eight weeks, and then I want you to give me a call and tell me what you notice. I'm going to give you my contact. If I, honestly, I want you to give me a call and tell me what you notice. I want you to try these three things every day for eight weeks. First, start every day asking yourself the question, what opportunities are there for me to practice the two things that I shared I want to be most remembered for? What opportunities are there for me to practice the two things that I shared with my partner that I want to be most remembered for? Secondly, courageously, and, and, and the answer to that question is going to be highly variable. One day, it may be a minute. Actually, I can do this for about a minute. Other day, it may be all day. I have an opportunity to practice this all day. Whatever it is, clarify it. Then, secondly, engage in the day courageously defining your success by the expression of your values with experiential acceptance. So in other words, <laughs> courageously engage in the day with experiential acceptance, which means I accept whatever happens. I can hope for good outcomes. I can want equity. There's nothing wrong with wanting equity and fairness. But I'm going to courageously engage in the day with experiential acceptance. At the end of the day, ask yourself, one, one, I want you to reflect on one thing, and that is I want you to take a minute and appreciate where you practiced those two things. Appreciate where you practiced those two things, and this is the critical, write this down. No buts allowed. Well, I did it for an hour, but I really could have done it two hours. Well, I did this, but I could have done it so much better. No buts allowed. Appreciate where you practice those two things. This is different than a gratitude journal. Gratitude journals are wonderful things, but gratitude journals tend to be reflections on being grateful for what has happened to me. I want you to focus on appreciating what you did to practice what you wanted to be remembered for. Do those three things for eight weeks, and I want you to call me and tell me what you notice. What did you learn? Because I want to learn from you. So they change how they think about values. They change how they think about worth. They also change how they think about stress. You will never hear us on our campus talk about stress reduction. We will never talk about stress reduction. We celebrate stress because stress is a function of caring. It's physiologically impossible to feel stress about anything unimportant to you. So if you're stressed, you're engaged in something that matters to you. That's a wonderful thing. 
But really what stress is, is this relationship, this inverse relationship between perceived capabilities and perceived demands. So when perceived capabilities, when I, when I add weight to perceived capabilities, there's a corresponding lessening of my perceived, of perceived demands. There's a corresponding lessening of my perceived capabilities. It's always inversely related. So if I add weight to the demands of the day, I will feel less and less capable. So if I've got to do this presentation, this report, that's with my supervisor, that's going to determine my performance evaluation, is going to determine our goals for the next three quarters, and that's going to determine how I'm going to advance in this company, that's going to determine the quality of my relationships, pretty soon this report is determining the next 50 years of my life. And you'll feel more and more stressed and anxious. Instead, you've got to find an equilibrium. How do you do that? They shift from noun-focused to verb-focused. People that flourish are more verb-focused instead of noun-focused. Nouns are outcomes. Nouns are outcomes you don't completely control. Every noun that you're striving for is an outcome you don't completely control, which adds weight to the perceived demands and lessens your perceived capabilities. Your life is actually centered around four verbs. If you will focus on four verbs and define your expression of your values through those four verbs, you find that equilibrium and your stress will work for you in a flourishing way. What are those four verbs? Learning, expressing what I've learned, relating, and taking care of myself. When you work, work to learn. Always be in a state of learning, not judgment. People that are flourish, they're highly self-accountable because they're analytical, they're not evaluative. The difference between being analytical and evaluative. Analytical is an honest intent to learn. Evaluative is very personal. Good, bad, success, failure. They're in this constant state of learning. And then they express what they've learned. Let me show them what I know. Yes, please. So learning and then expressing what I've learned. Show your talent. Show your talent and training to date. It's the biggest distinction between the last three Olympiads in terms of performance. The Olympic athletes that chased the noun to validate the sacrifice that them and the world around them placed of, study, of working their whole lives for this Olympic moment, those individuals that needed that noun to justify all of that sacrifice did not meddle. They underperformed. The individuals that overperformed and meddled focused on the verb of, let me just express what I've learned and my talent to date. Let me express my training and talent to date. It was just another opportunity to express themselves. They hit PRs. They had personal records that they had never attained before because they were verb focused. Third is relating. Relating. If I think about relationships, I'm constantly evaluating. If I think about my relationship with Michelle, I'm thinking, how are we doing now? How about now? Why did you look at me that way? Oh my God, what does that mean? It's we're constantly evaluating ourselves. But if I focus on relating with Michelle, I completely control that. I completely control that. So my stress about it is much less. How do I want to relate? With curiosity, with kindness, with respect, whatever it is, I control it. And then taking care of yourself. At any point of the day, one of those four verbs will be relevant. So if you get stressed or overwhelmed to the point where it's working against you, breathe and move into one of those four verbs. One of those four verbs will be relevant. Move into ne your next right verb. And with that, not only change how you think about stress, change how you breathe. Change how you breathe. Everyone put their hand on their chest, one hand on your chest, upper chest, and one hand right below your navel. And I want you to breathe naturally for a while. Just for a little bit, just breathe naturally and notice which hand moves more. Which hand moves more? Become aware of that. When we plateau and when we're stuck at good and when we're stressed and noun focused, we chest breathe. You chest breathe. And when you chest breathe, you actually keep the sympathetic nervous system activated. 
vagus nerve stimulation is when you focus on diaphragmatic breathing where your lower hand moves more when you're breathing. What you're doing is you're stimulating the vagus nerve that runs through your diaphragm, and that activates the parasympathetic nervous system. How many of you have a military background? Anybody have a military background? Those of you know this. Elite athletes know this. Do this exercise when you feel overwhelmed. Breathe in to a count of four using your lower, using your diaphragm, moving your, your lower hand. Hold for a count of four. Breathe out for a count of four and do that for five minutes. When you do that, that activates your parasympathetic nervous system that moves you into a state of calm where your critical and creative thinking are enhanced by 30%. The old adage is what we used to think about with willpower and things like that, or the reason I procrastinate is I work better under pressure. No, you don't. You just are feeling the surge of your sympathetic nervous system kicking into gear. Eventually, it's going to kind of get in the way. Instead, if I can maintain this sense of calm through breathing, it helps activate that, that, that um, parasympathetic nervous system. So change how you breathe and change your lexicon. Change your language. I want you to become very aware over the next month how often you say or think or hear from others these three words. Have to, need to, can't. Have to, need to, can't. Whenever we stay and think, have to, need to, can't, you're leading with fear. Fear is leading. That dynamic relationship between values and fear, fear just kind of moved to the foreground. Because the truth is, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to do anything. There's consequences, but you don't have to do anything. But out of fear, I will say, oh, I, Jason, I, I can't go out with you now because I, I have to do this project. No, it's really, uh, if I said, no, I don't want to go out with you. I'm afraid of what you're going to think of me. And so what happens is we get into this state of have to, need to, can't, and you stay at your neurology. Instead, change your lexicon to just this. It's right for me to do this. It's right for me not to do this. I choose to do this. I choose not to do this. This sounds really picky, but we've done brain mapping. And just these two sentences reworded, complete difference in how your brain responds. Take these two sentences. I have to work on this project that's due at noon. Versus it's right for me to work on this project that's due at noon. Doesn't change your reality. Reality is still the same. Your brain is much more resilient in the second question. What you do is you move from resentment to resilience. By owning it. Finding that sense of ownership. So, change how you think about values. Shift how you define worth instead of by equity, by integrity. Shift how you breathe. Shift how you think about your language. The last thing I want you to think about is change how you make decisions around values. I want you to make this commitment to yourself. Give yourself a... This, this is what happens with people that flourish. I know we got to wrap up here. I'm, I'm just another second and then we're done. Thank you, Wes. Give yourself a 24-hour pause before you say yes to any opportunity that speaks to your values. Even if you know you're going to do it, say, sounds great, let me get back to you tomorrow. And during that 24 hours, ask yourself two questions. At what value this opportunity? First, assume that you're 100% committed because you will be. No one's sitting around looking for things to do. You will be 100% committed. Ask yourself two questions. At what value this opportunity and at what cost? People that flourish have the courage to ask that second question. We tend not to ask that because it feels wrong to say no to an opportunity that speaks to our values. We feel guilty about saying no that's to something that's, that speaks to us, that would matter to us. And then you get overcommitted. It's the number one predictor of burnout because you, you convince yourself of this fallacy of, oh, I'll find energy somewhere. I'll find time and energy somewhere. And you don't. You just get overcommitted. You become the hit. You become the cost. At what value and at what cost? Why do we do this? It comes down to two things. We're trying to move you from this chronically evaluative mindset to an expressive mindset, to where the value, the, how you're judging your worth is by the expression of your values. Why? That's where you're in when you're in the zone. You've heard of the zone state, the flow state, when, every, when you are at your optimal in terms of performance. When you're at your optimal, you're in an expressive mindset. They focus on developing these two things, but it's not how we define them. 
It's not trust in the concept of, oh, I just have faith everything's going to be okay. Oh, everything will be fine. Or compassion is, oh, I just love everybody. Nope. Trust is defined by three things. I trust that I know what my personal truth is right now. I know what matters to me right now. Secondly, I trust that I know what it looks like in action. And third, when it's hard and hurtful, I trust that I can take care of myself in a healthy way. That's the deepest form of trust. Why do they train for that? Trust is the only thing that overrides fear. Trust is the only thing that overrides fear. Secondly, they focus on compassion by a commitment to one thing, active curiosity. Active curiosity. Because active curiosity is the skill that builds empathy. And they're constantly towards self and others. They're constantly in this state of learning. Constantly learning and curious about why they do what they do and the impact with each other. Because these two factors, if I'm in a state of trust, fear is in the background. If I'm in a state of curiosity, evaluation's in the background. This is how you create that sweet spot of values and fear. And that's what leads to expression. So when you look at that, what we're really talking about, this is one of my favorite paintings. It's from a 1930s Belgian artist, Rene Magritte. The way I want you to think about it is all of us, every single year, are going to have these evolving uncertainties in our life. Things that are important to us but have not completely evolved. The only way you can look at this and see that is through a lens of trust and compassion. Because if you look at this through a lens of fear and judgment, that looks very different. It looks very different. The heart of it is this. You want to flourish? Focus on these four things. First, show up. Have the courage to show up. Secondly, show up with your values. Third, completely define your success and self-worth by the expression of those values. And fourth, when the world rewards you for that, celebrate that as a great day. That's a great day. Not a new standard. It's a great day. And and when the world beats you up for that, you focus only on self-care. Only on self-care. I succeeded. Got a little beat up from it. Let me take care of myself. Instead of, what does this say about me, my future, and the world around me? Which immediately kicks in this evaluative mindset. And then tomorrow, show up. Think of it this way. I'll leave you with this last statement. We're all heading toward this town over here, and this town's name is Control. We're all driving to Control. And then we decide to turn around and go 180 degrees in the opposite to this town that's the opposite of Control. When I ask people, what's the name of that town? Most people say chaos, because the opposite of control is chaos. Actually, the opposite of control is trust. But to get to trust, you got to go through this other little town. This is the town of vulnerability. And we tend not to like that town because of vulnerability. We, We fear being hurt, we fear being played, and we fear being perceived as weak. So we just turn around and head back toward control, or we try to drive around vulnerability to get to trust, or we just pull off the road. But... What you did this morning, we hung out in the town of vulnerability. Every one of you shared something very personal and very true to some of you, complete strangers. Was there ever any moment in your sharing that you doubted the truth of what you were sharing? You completely trusted what you shared was true. And was there ever any moment when you were listening to your partner that you thought, how pathetic are you? How weak are you? (laughs) Or were you admiring the power and the strength of what they were sharing. That's that deeper level. The only way you get to a level of trust that trumps fear is being able to move through this sense of self-awareness and the courage to define your wealth by, your, your worth by the expression of those values and just curiously, courageously being curious about it every day. Instead of ending every day with, you know, this happened to me last week. It was like, you know, today I totally led with fear. I just controlled and avoided my way throughout the whole day. Instead of ending with idiot, you ended with, what about today made me vulnerable to leading with fear? And what can I do with that for tomorrow? Staying in that state of curiosity. I want to thank you for the honor of your time, and thank you for the honor of me going a couple of minutes beyond. I apologize for that, Wes. And thank you for your active curiosity. I look forward to hearing all from all of you in eight weeks. 
to hear what you noticed about the, the challenge that I asked you to consider. Always please know I'm just a phone call away. Please let me know if I can support you or help you. I'll send some things to Nicole for you to be able to look out a little further. And as always, Aileron and the Matil family just have this wonderful place in my heart because they have always been so supportive of our research and have been strong advocates all along the way. I have learned much more from them than they will ever learn from me. And just what a beautiful setting for us to go and share our wisdom together. So thank you at Aileron for all you do for us. It's changing the world, and I appreciate it. But here's the truth. Just the people in this room right here, you being you, and you defining your worth by your values will change this world. Just the people in this room will change this world. So I look forward to watching how the world changes as a function of you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.